Hey, this is Erin Lindstrom, and you're listening to Thank You For You. This is a show about celebrating and acknowledging our humanness as well as our beingness, the easy and the hard, the gifts and the (laughs) gifts we don't really like but choose to accept anyway. This is a show about and for people in pursuit of more peace, more joy, more money, more justice, and more of the awe that life has to give us. Thank you for being here, and thank you for you. Welcome back to Thank You For You. Today is a special day because you are alive. Great news. <laughs> Our guest today is one of my favorite people. As you can tell, I just invite my favorite people to talk to me. And that's why this podcast happens. And Joanna is no no different. She is a phenomenal person. She is absolutely brilliant when it comes to creating communities and especially in the business world, using your community to create more sales, client retention, and actually have people like experience magic when they are in your, in your vibe, in your container, in your space, you know? So before we get to the conversation, I will share with you Joanna's official bio. So Joanna Novello is a badass entrepreneur who understands the power behind having an engaged community. As a community strategist, Joanna helps entrepreneurs create unique and engaging experiences for their communities so their fans turn into repeat customers. By making audiences feel seen, heard, and taken care of, Joanna helps some of the biggest names on the internet create win-win situations where community members are thrilled and their businesses thrive. I love (laughs) win-wins. Joanna, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you. Um, fun fact, do you know that you wrote that bio? Do you know how many people on this podcast say that? <laughs> so funny. I'm like, looking back, I'm like, okay, we can tweak it in a couple places, but overall, I love it. It's great. <laughs> uh, so the first question that I bring to all of my guests, you are welcome to take this, interpret it as you wish. Um, who are you and how did you get here? God, that is so hard. Um, okay. Who am I? So I am Joanna. I am a mother. I am a wife. I am an entrepreneur. I'm a pet mother. I'm a former Girl Scout troop leader, a former room parent. Mm. (laughs) Just, just to like get the scope of like what moms really do. Right. Seriously. Um, how did I get here? That's, that's interesting. So I'm a free spirit. I was born into the military Mm. and I was born in Germany. I grew up in Kentucky. I went to college in San Francisco. I now live in Puerto Vallarta. Wow. And I, I I think I've always had this, um, non-attachment to places. Like I, I get somewhere and I'm like, I'm, I am complete here. Mm. Um, I spent 15 years in Kentucky I spent 15 years in San Francisco and at each point I just said, I'm complete and it is time to leave. (laughs) (laughs) What does complete feel like to you? So it feels like when I leave and I come back, there's something missing to me, Mm. which I knew that I felt that when I, I had come down to Puerto Vallarta in October of 2019 to visit schools when we were exploring moving down here. And when I got back to San Francisco, it was an emptiness. Mm. And I just knew that it was, it was time to open up to something different. Interesting. All right. So we're just going to hop into this if that's okay. Cause yeah, like, let's it. okay. So I find this fascinating. Cause to me, that's, that's really intuition and like letting your not just your feelings as in your emotions guide you, but that inner knowing of like, nope, this isn't correct anymore. And I imagine, tell us a little bit about your path, like into entrepreneurship and having your own business. Did that have that same sort of like open, like how did you make decisions to land yourself in your own business? So I actually went to school for entrepreneurship and I've heard a lot of people make jokes that I did not not know that. Yeah, I did. That was my major in college. Um, what? Yeah. Okay. I love this. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. I know I've read a lot of people say that you can't go to school for entrepreneurship. And it was actually the first thing that my professor said on the first day of our class. She's like, can entrepreneurship be taught? And 
basically what she told us is everything that we were learning in business school, you're going to do the opposite of what they tell us to do. And that we would just listen to what she was saying inside of our class. So, wow. Yeah. It was this two year program that we went through. We had one professor and the reason why I got into it actually was because my school was overcrowded and you couldn't get registered for the classes that you needed. Mm -hmm. Um, I was going to do general business management, but couldn't get into the classes I needed. So this was offered as an elective. So that's how I ended up. Wow. In this yeah. Um, so I took it and I was just kind of blown away by this professor. She was really saucy and she had a completely different view on business. And so I, I started off taking it as an elective just to get through to get priority for the next semester to get my actual classes. But then I was like, you know what? I really like this. And we um, had to choose a business that we were going to start. And for the next two years, we were going to work on it. And I oh, wanted wow. to, yeah. Um, so by the time you graduated, because we actually got connected to like Silicon Valley investors, we would do shark tank type things during class with these investors. And um, by the time you graduated, you were supposed to be ready to launch your business. And I wanted to start a spa because I thought, man, it'd be so cool to just like have my own spa and like be in my zone. And I ended up uh, picking something else, but then I graduated and de postpartum depression, I had a baby right in the middle of like this program and mm -hmm. it was really intense. It's a 10% graduate rate out of wow. her. So it's, she sets it up to fail because in the real world, you're set up to fail as an entrepreneur. So she was like, <laughs> she said, it's a 10% success rate in here. And um, so I had a baby and I, once I had graduated, I went into postpartum depression because I think I finally started processing like what was happening. My daughter was a year old at that time. Um, so I was a stay at home mom for a little while and was just like, ugh. Like, I want to do something. I want to contribute. My husband was working two jobs so I could stay home and, like, get myself through this depression. And, um, and then I got pregnant again. So I was looking online, and I had found um, this job that looked kind of sketch, but you could work from home and make good money. And so I applied for it, and it was for a company called 17 Hat. Mm -hmm. And um, it ended up being legitimate. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> they, they hired me as their account manager and, um, it was for this new service they were trying out to go on top of like the, the software that they provide, which most people just know the software now, but at the time they had a service they were providing. And this woman named Lindsay Padilla signed up for an account and she was assigned <laughs> to me because we were both in the Bay area. Lindsay was in Santa Rosa at the time. And we got on the call to do like our onboarding call. And I didn't really know like what a vibe was. Like I had never met a vibe before in my life. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> but I remember like as soon as Lindsay turned her camera on, it was like the sun came out from behind a cloud. Wow. And, and she was like, hey. <laughs> and we just like instantly clicked. And um and so we were working together for a while and they ended up shutting down my division. And Lindsay said, look, we're jumping ship, obviously, because they're going to shut this thing down. We really like working with you. We being her and Derek, because mm -hmm. Derek was also a character, but like in his own right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and she's like, you should come work for me and Derek. And so I started working with them. Um, I didn't know that I had just landed my very first, not only my first client, but like an A-list client. Like I didn't realize that Lindsay was the celebrity that she is. And <laughs> for anyone listening, Lindsay Padilla, Dr. Lindsay Padilla, friend of the pod, you can go back and check out her episode too. She is one of, of course, one of my favorite people, but definitely check that out. Yeah. She's a total character. Um, and and she just started introducing me to people in her network. And she has an amazing network. Lynn, she, she's an amazing networker. Um, I started off as her VA and her and Emily Hirsch had a program together called the Funnel Playground. 
And one day, both of them were traveling and Lindsay said, I just need you to pop into the group and just keep an eye on it while we're both traveling and we can't Mm -hmm. um, devote any time to it. So this group was about Facebook ads and funnels, which I knew nothing about. And this is actually really how my business took off because I started off as a VA for Lindsay and then transitioned into community manager through this. And this is what I actually grew my business out of. But there were about 40 members in there, which is like the perfect testing ground for me. And they were asking me, you know, like, how do I do this ad set? How do I upload audiences? And I was like, yeah, I don't know, but here's a GIF. And so I would like post a GIF behind the scenes. I would be like in Slack, like, Hey, what's a custom audience? Like, (laughs) I don't know. I need an answer ASAP. Mm -hmm. And then it just became this thing where when people would ask a question, they would want their GIF. It was, it became like a tradition. Like if Mm -hmm. I ask a question, I better get a GIF and then I want my answer. Mm -hmm. And then one member from that community said, Hey, I want you to come do that in my community. And then the next one, Hey, I like what you do here. Come do it in mine. And then pretty soon I had a client list of like seven to 10 groups Mm -hmm. and, um, I, I had a business and it literally grew out of me sending gifts and, I, I tell people that you can do, you can do whatever you want on the internet that I like literally built a business out of sending gifts. And (laughs) literally when I get on sales calls, it is the thing that people bring up and I'm like, okay, what is it that you want to accomplish? And I'm like in strategy mode, right? Like, okay, are we converting? Are we engaging or doing this? And they're like, the gifts are hilarious. (laughs) And I'm like, okay. (laughs) Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we'll send gifts. Um, yeah, I just want you to just hang out and send gifts to my people. Like, I think that would make them happy. Uh, and I feel like on the internet, you can do whatever you want. So um, that became my business. And then I started moving out of management and then into strategy. So now I just do strategy and um, I have like a framework that I pulled out over the past couple of years. And mm-hmm. that's what I do. I love that. So <laughs> the gifts are obviously, and just so everyone knows, some, t- some of you may pronounce it GIFs. I don't know who you are and how you live your life, but that's what we're saying. Not GIFs, G-I-F, all capitals, GIF, GIF, live your best life. Anyway, um, so Joanna, obviously like that is what caught people's attention. And I think that's interesting. It reminds me like the metaphor that I'm getting in my head is like, uh, <laughs> courtship and like being sent flowers and you're like, Oh my God, I love the flowers. I love, be- I love being with this person. Cause I keep getting flowers. Da, 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 da. But behind that, there's obviously like a relationship that's being built and there's this other stuff happening behind the scenes. And so can you talk to us a little bit about like why the gift like represents something it's doing something. It's almost like humanizing the situation, right? That is not just what you do. Like I know your brain, I've had you think about my (laughs) communities, you know what I mean? And talked about that. And so like, that's like the icing on the cake. I want to know about the cake. Like what actually goes into having a successful. And when I say successful community, I do not mean 10,000 people. I don't give a shit, to be honest, about the number. My group right now is, I think, less than 400, three something. It is a successful community because they are nurtured and they've come there and they hang out with me and then people move into packages, right? That's how I'm defining success here. Um, But I would love for you to share with us, just from your perspective, like what is the cake part of that, not just the icing? Yeah. So I would say that 99% of people that come to me about community are approaching it in the wrong way because they see it as, um, okay, so how do I get the most money I can out of this specific launch? Mm -hmm. There's a very short term thinking to it. Um, and I think that they are oftentimes really shy to own whatever magic it is that they have because they think that they need to put themselves in this container of like selling or, um, how do I engage with them? They, they like to stick to the norms. Whereas this is not just, um, like you're dealing with people here, which is what separates you from the the rest of the funnel is that you're not dealing with data and, um, you know, design and anything like that. It's very, this is the human portion of it where, 
okay, I talked about you this whole time and now you're here in front of me. So now what are we going to do about it? Right. I did all this work to get you here. Yeah. It's like, I got you to the party. You got the invitation. You liked the design on the card. You said yes. And now yes. you're showing up at the party and it's like, okay, how do I, how do I have a party? Thank you. Yes. On the internet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's actually the easiest part of it, right? Like to use your metaphor, like, or, or actually to take it a step further and use it as like a wedding, because I think sometimes the stress Mm. level of launches and stuff is like a wedding, like you're launching a marriage, right? Like there's shows about this stuff, right? About like bridezillas and like how stressful it gets and how um, this is supposed to be like one of the best moments of your life. But the lead up to it is, is crazy. But then the, the one thing that they need to do at the reception is just to slow down and spend time with the family that they've invited And I think that's where people drop off. They don't realize that this is the point where you just need to relax and have fun. And this is the part where they get to firsthand see like, and and feel your energy and get to know you um, because it's a two-way conversation, which is what makes it different than other social media channels. It's, it's not the same, which is why I'm not, I'm just going to like slip this in here because it drives Mm -hmm. me nuts, but repurposing your content and thinking that it's okay is, is not okay with me. Like you could send that over to LinkedIn. You could do it to Twitter. Those are all one-sided media, social media channels, but the group, I have the option to post and have a voice inside of your group. That's what makes it different. So getting to be able for them to see you, experience you, get to know you, that's what makes it different. And behind the scenes, what I'm trying to do is encourage them to own whatever it is that makes them unique and special and to not shy away from it. Because I see a lot of people cling to what that their coaches are doing or what their mentors are doing, what their friends are doing, because they feel that it's safe. And for some reason, being yourself is not seen as safe. People Mm -hmm. don't find, um, which is one of the things why I love your community, Erin, is because you're comfortable with yourself. Like you're okay with being you. And I find that's actually very rare Mm. for a lot of people. They need the templates. They need the the hand-holding. And it's actually like, but if we were just sitting in front of each other, like, how would you talk to me? How would you interact with me? Yeah. You're really bringing the human, like the human meets human. That's really interesting. I've never thought about it as like a two-sided conversation, whereas most social media is one-sided. You might be popping in the comments and liking or emojiing or whatever, but this is like, welcome to my house. (laughs) Come inside. It is a different level of intimacy. And you're right. Not everyone is comfortable with that. I feel like one of the things, um, A, I think I'm just naturally kind of like this. I like to be the hostess. I really my friendships are really important to me. I love learning about people. Like part of this is just who I am as a person. On the other side of that, I think improv has helped me a ton with this too. And actually just learning to be really fucking comfortable, like making shit up on the spot. And like improv is a great way to practice that, but your whole life is improvised. Like if we really think about this, like we're constantly creating and making shit up and connecting with each other and like creating stories. So I think there's an element of play that's really important to just let people like go have like go make a friend, sweetheart. Like, and I notice with my kids, which is just interesting, like they will say to me at the playground, I'm like, go make a friend. And my son Jack the other day was like, I'm too shy. And I was like, well, you can be shy and brave. I'm like, do you want me to tell you what to say? He's like, yeah. I'm like, just go say, hi, I'm Jack. Want to play? And he's like, oh, I don't know if I can. In the meantime, Violet is like, oh, there's a girl. She looks my age. Bye. And she goes right over and she's like, hi. And I'm like, okay. So not, it's okay. I'm just sharing this in that like, we're all different. We all have different blocks. We all have different comforts. But I think finding your way in for Jack, it was actually once this little girl approached Approached, you know, I, I bridged them over and I was like, Hey, do you want to play with him? And then he took off from there. Sometimes you need that, which is why it can be helpful to have another person in your group and your past clients being in your group. If it's a free one, like they kind of become that bridge, but that bridge can only be built if you're willing to connect in the first place. Do you have any tips for people yeah. who are building their groups and are like, ah, <laughs> like it doesn't feel hard or it does feel hard. It doesn't feel natural. How do you usually like tell people to 
get in there or to rethink it? Right, or like, yeah. how do we get past that block? Two things there. So you talked about doing improv. So I was, I, I come from the restaurant industry. So yes, I have like been a server and a bartender. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why I made a really good community manager is because you learn to deal with so many different personalities in a short amount of time. Mm-hmm. And you're just bouncing back and forth and like having to entertain people and start conversations and like keep them fun and engaged because you're working for the tip. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing when you're like running a business, like you're working to get the sale. The second thing is that when you were talking about bridging that gap there. So a lot of people, when they have small groups get really uncomfortable Mm -hmm. because they're like, well, nobody's talking. And just like how you're saying how you bridge that for Jack, or having like past clients in there. Mm -hmm. If you have a small group, that's actually your chance to find your voice in front of this smaller group. And I I think that people overlook the small groups and, and then they, I'm like, but if you were at 3000 right now, what would you be doing different than what you're doing right now? And Mm -hmm. they really can't answer that question because it's, you're doing the same thing with 10 to 20 people as you Mm -hmm. would be doing to five to 10,000 people. You're just doing it on a larger scale. And some people will never grow their groups beyond or like to big, whatever big means to you, because they don't put the, the foundation in, they don't put the work in to discover like, what does it take for me to engage 10 to 15 people? Then what does it take to do a hundred? And then once you're there, it's like, it's the same thing. You're just engaging with people, getting to know them, starting conversations. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. Uh, Like what's going through my head right now is um, people, a lot of times what I hear, and you, I think you probably hear the same thing, which is like, they're only willing to show up if there is a big crowd. It's like, I'm not willing to do it when it's little, it almost, it comes off as this isn't good enough for me, but the truth in my opinion, there is the other side of that, which is like, I'm not good enough for this. If there's only 20 people and they're really paying attention to me, or what if I can't do it? What does that mean about me? And so we avoid doing anything just because it's quote unquote small versus actually getting in there, using what we have and then moving forward. Yeah. You know, numbers don't mean anything because Mm. I've had people with a hundred thousand members in there who can't make a dollar Mm. out of it. it. And it, it's the same thing. I think we're starting to wake up with like Instagram followers. I have people who come to me with like 450,000 followers on Instagram Mm -hmm. and they're like, well, I have this community, but I'm not making any money off of it. And then there's this perception from people on the outside, like, well, they're verified with this many followers. It doesn't mean anything if they can't have a conversation with 10 people to convert them. Right. Right. Oh, it's not just about the numbers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know that groups like with, um, with 300 to 400 people who, um, Scott Oldford is a great example of this. Scott never cared about the money. He was always more about quality over quantity. And he had a group of maybe 1500 people, but was making like bank off of it every month because he got the right people in and he knew how to hold their attention Mm -hmm. and it never phased him because he was too busy making money. And then when you deliver on that, then you can go and advertise and bring more people in, do your testimonials by delivering results. And the people that focus on the numbers, I'm always like, I don't think we're going to be a good fit together because we're going to have to retrain that Mm -hmm. and get back to what's important. Mm. Okay. So getting back to what's important and really like, it sounds like coming back, you kind of have to know your values and your vision. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Um, By the way, Lindsay, I, I learned a lot of this from Lindsay because Lindsay knew how to work a group of a hundred people. Mm -hmm. And she's in the comments still to this day. Um, Mm -hmm. You'll see her comment back to every person Mm -hmm. talking to every person. And I saw that firsthand. And that was the difference when I started getting other clients who weren't doing that, who weren't willing to put the work in. That was the difference between why she could convert and they couldn't. Wow. 
knowing her too, I'm just like, oh, it's the value. And I could be wrong here, but like uh, the value of people and like mm-hmm. actually caring about them and their experience versus just yours. Yeah. Yes. Ooh. Okay. This is interesting. Cause this goes into me too, is like, if you're overvaluing their experiencing and forgetting about yours, that typically looks like I have a group, but no one's buying. Cause you're not actually asking for a sale. And on the other end, if you don't give a shit about them, but you keep selling, like that's not a great group either. And so right. really finding that equilibrium is where the magic is made. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Fascinating. So this, before we hopped on, Joanna and I were talking off air And this kind of like feels parallel to me because obviously we're talking about groups right now, but with it, with all business things, I feel like there's always this like life mirror that goes with it of like, you know, they say like how you do one thing is how you do everything. And I like 90% of me agrees with that. (laughs) Um, But this idea of like taking the next step, being willing to put in the work, like that is entrepreneurship, right? So when we kind of like say no to the group or putting in the work at the ground level, like you're trying to bypass something. Um, and I know, like, I would love for you to share with us, is there something in your personal life that kind of like mirrors this where you did something that's like, I don't know necessarily what the next step is, but like I went and took that leap and like, we're figuring it out as we go, like based on your values. Yeah. So as with a lot of people, when COVID happened, um, there were some major life changes for us. Mm-hmm. And we were actually preparing for a move to Mexico. And um, I, I know that like a lot of people are t- like, I do feel like this is kind of like a movie. Like, I feel like sometimes when I tell the story of like the day that we came down here, it does feel crazy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but, you know, like think March 29, 2020, when we were starting to like the first cases were hitting in the U S and, um, we, so in October of 2019, I had come to Mexico to Puerto Vallarta to scope out the school scene, just get a feel for, um, how we would like it potentially. Mm -hmm. And so we had already been in the works. I was slowly breaking the news to our friends and family and like the school family that, Mm -hmm. Hey, we're not going to be here next year. Like we were easing into it. And so some people already had a heads up that it was happening. Um, then COVID happened and it just seemed like this earthquake and tornado happened at the same time. And it just shook all of us up. I mean, I think there was a great migration across the entire country world, let's say. Mm -hmm. Um, and we were, in Sacramento, we had actually, um, we had gone virtual at that point and it was like day two <laughs> like, of school. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we had, uh, taken off from school to go to Sacramento, um, to get our passports taken out for the kids to get their Mexican passports. Um, so luckily I, two years before, had secured um, the citizenship for our kids. And it was, I mean, government paperwork is, if I would want to avoid anything, it would be that. And we did. And we put it off for so long. It was like, this was wrong and this was wrong. And then we needed a witness. And we finally got that done. So that's always a lesson to me of like, even if you don't need it right there in that moment, like I push myself to get things done because this is a great example of like, I didn't know that COVID was going to happen and we were going to leave the country. Mm -hmm. Um, So we were in Sacramento to get the passports done early. We were planning on leaving in July of 2020. And so this was in March. We were like getting our paperwork in order. So we're here at the time we were living in San Francisco. So this was like an hour and a half to get to Sacramento. Um, we're there and we're sitting in the waiting room. And I was, I got an alert on my phone saying that they were going to put California in lockdown. Mm. And I looked up and I see the two security guards like taking chairs away, Mm -hmm. but like leaving some Mm -hmm. and then having like this really weird gap between each one. Mm Mm-hmm which is so normal now, but at the time it looked like a sci-fi movie. I remember I took a picture and sent it to my friend and I was mm-hmm. like, look at these chairs. Like this is the <laughs> what is happening. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're 
like the room is like humongous. Like it's this huge office and we're taking up an entire row. We're four people in this family. And my, my son is like so far away from me. And I'm like, this is just bizarre. And so I'm telling Juan, I'm like, we're going into lockdown tomorrow night. And I was like, I think we should just leave. <laughs> like what? <laughs> I was like, yeah, we should just leave. And so he had, um, his, cause my husband is a chef. So his restaurant had gone, um, they had been shut down. Mm-hmm. My daughter was online at that point, And I was like, I like, this is not going to be three weeks. Like, mm-hmm. there's no way that this entire worldwide virus is going to come and be gone in three weeks. Like mm-hmm. this is crazy. Um, and then like, I'm, I'm not a like total conspiracy theorist, but I was like, there are going to be a lot of people who benefit off of people being sick. So yes, this is going to be prolonged. Like there's no way they would just let this go. Um, America loves to see you sick. (laughs) And that's the, that's the sad truth. Um, but we were like having this conversation. I could totally tell it was a no from Juan. (laughs) It was like, you know, like, wow, I should like divorce this lady. She's like psycho. And we get the passports and I was like, there's like literally nothing else. Like we have our paperwork is now officially done. Mm. Everybody's online. I could in Mexico, like get us through this Mm -hmm. period of time. Mm -hmm. And on the way back, we just, um, you know, I was like pros and cons, like cost benefit, like what, Mm -hmm. what, like, let's think through everything, turn over every stone. And I finally convinced him. And so this is the part that I don't tell a lot of people. I actually don't know if I've told anybody. So maybe this podcast is the, is the great place to tell it. We actually tried to drive to the border. And I think we both knew that we weren't going to make it Mm -hmm. because we weren't prepared. Um, And we went to San Diego. So we drove that night. We packed Mm -hmm. some bags and we drove that night. We actually ended up leaving our cat in the apartment. And we were going to have a friend come and pick him up. And that was it. We were like, okay, we're just going to drive down there. But we didn't have the documentation because we were leasing our car. So we didn't have the documents Mm -hmm. to get across the border. And we didn't have um, the proper documentation for our dog who was with us. We were there at the border like literally staring at the border. And I think we, I literally like, I think we didn't know that we knew we weren't going to make it, but for some reason we needed to have that really long drive. Mm -hmm. And so we drew, we drove down from SF to San Diego and then from San Diego back up. Mm -hmm. This was all within like six, literally 16 hours. Mm -hmm. Um, And we were like crying the whole time because Mm -hmm. it was just scary period, just COVID period of like, what the hell is happening right now? And then Juan said on the way back, he said, let's buy plane tickets and then we'll go. And um, he had been fighting this the whole time, by the way. Mm -hmm. But we got back to SF. Um, We got some like emergency doctor notes to get both of our pets on board. Juan went to the airport and bought four plane tickets it was literally the last flight wow. that was going out. And um, we were trying to leave the next day because we were having trouble with the doctor note from, for the pets. And we just wanted to like try and pack up or like grab pictures or whatever. And the guy was like, no, flights are suspended starting at midnight. This is your, this 10 o'clock flight is the last one. So we um, bought the tickets. That night at 10 o'clock, we were sitting in the terminal crying. (laughs) Like, we we just had no idea, like, what is really going on? Um, And I had been texting one of my clients, Suzu was a great friend of mine. And um, she had kind of been talking us through a lot of this. And she said, I said, I don't know what we're going to do. We don't have the money to just, like, get on a plane and, like, do this. And she said... I'll front you the next three months, which was the remainder of our contract. Mm -hmm. And she said, and, and you can buy the tickets and you can um, get a hotel when you get down there. So we bought, we got on the plane. We went to Mexico city. Um, 
we were so tired that we, because by this point we hadn't slept in like 72 hours Mm -hmm. (laughs) and we were, we thought that we lost our passports. And so we were like breaking down crying, but then it was just like, it was like hanging out of our backpack (laughs) and we were like, Oh my God, they're right here. Oh my goodness. And then we missed our connecting flight to Puerto Vallarta because we couldn't figure out the airport. Um, We got rebooked, finally got on a flight and then got here. As soon as we got here, um, there's like an OXO, which is like a 7-Eleven. It's like the Mm 7-Eleven chain here. So we were sitting outside. I opened up my laptop and we booked a hotel and um, we had the next three nights set up. Um, We get to the hotel. The next morning, I had a podcast interview. (laughs) I'm like up, like doing this interview for this podcast. Um, And then it was okay, client work as fast as I can. And then we need to find somewhere to live. Airbnb was being shut down because mm-hmm. they, of COVID, mm-hmm. um, we managed to get in with um, like a one week reservation right before they were shutting down. And then after that, you couldn't get an Airbnb at all. So the guy that we rented from allowed us to rent from him for an additional month. So we had a month to figure it out. Right when we started that one month lease, I had, a, I signed a client and then a week later I signed another client and then we were able to put a deposit down on the house that we're living in right now, which magically one day I was scrolling through Craigslist, like all, like everything I could. And this place just popped up on my feed and it was a three bedroom house in a private neighborhood with security. It had a pool and a playground and it was like little and tiny. We came here, we looked at it and I was like blown away that we were able to find this place. We got it secured for a year and then that's when we moved in here. And it just kind of seems like, like how we were talking about the mirror Mm -hmm. between life and entrepreneurship that we had no idea what was going to happen. And we were actually crying through the whole thing. Yeah. All of us. Yep. And it was like, this is so scary. I have no idea what's going to happen, but we have to do this. Yeah. Like there's no other choice. We have Mm -hmm. to do this. And, um, I know had we stayed, my husband, he didn't technically lose his job, but he was getting two hours a day, which in San Francisco, doesn't even pay for your training ticket. (laughs) Right. Right. Um, and we knew that crime, which was already really, really bad. Like if you don't live in the Bay area, yeah. Crime has been like really off the charts for the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. It like has gone into like super crazy mode since COVID happened. But I was like, we're, this is not going to be safe to stay here Mm -hmm. and we're going to struggle for food. And we get down here and like the hoarding thing that was happening in the U S with like toilet paper. And mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. was totally not a thing down here. Wow. Like you come down here, you could get whatever you want, alcohol, Clorox, uh, toilet paper. It was just like all there on the shelf. And I had, I told Juan to ask the lady like, Oh, ask her like, if it's really hard to get a hold of this stuff. Cause I didn't want to hoard if we didn't need to. Right. And she looked at us like we were crazy. She was yeah. like, no, like there's enough. Like, <laughs> there's more than it. enough here. Yeah. Wow. And um, so that's how we got here. I would say the past year has been, um, and, and I've like processed a lot of this stuff through Human Being Club with you and mm-hmm. the other amazing members inside of there. But the 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 change in dynamic and of just daily life of what COVID itself has brought that would wouldn't have been um, you know any different had we stayed there or come here, but me being the breadwinner now, um, us trying to figure out like when do things go back to normal and what does normal even look like mm-hmm. like just trying to work through those things in the past year has been, um, it has been a journey. It, yeah. 
And it's hard to like face these things. Um, you know, like I no longer like take care of the house or take care of the kids or like do the school thing. Like my husband is the one that takes care of all of that. Mm -hmm. And that was a good six months of like awkwardness. Yeah. Transition is weird, (laughs) right? It is. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, in Mexico, there's more of a, like, uh, they're, they're a lot more male dominant. And so it's very bizarre for them to do the things that Mm -hmm. like my husband is doing. And so, Like his mom made a lot of comments to him about like, why aren't you working and Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Gender roles, like that sort of thing. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, And then trying to figure out like as a family, like what does happiness look like? How are we defining success at this point right now? Yeah. Um, Which I think is across the board, right? To like all families dealing with COVID. Yeah. Sorry. I just had like a light bulb go off. Cause I'm like, Oh, this is values and vision. And like using that for your family as a community, it's the same thing that you're doing inside the groups, but to like align yourself and then show up for them and like all of the things. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of like the, the, the main thing, like when I reflect back on it is that I had such a desire inside of me to make this thing happen. Mm -hmm. And I was crying through it the whole time. I didn't know how it was going to happen, but I just told myself it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And things just, um, it's like the alchemist, like the, the road will build itself for you, like one brick at a time, Mm -hmm. which is entrepreneurship, right? Like you don't know you're every single day walking into the unknown, every project that you decide to take on every client, all of it is an unknown. And like some days I do cry through all of it. Like (laughs) it it literally is like sitting at the airport being like, I don't know where we're going to end up, but yeah, but I know we're going somewhere. Yeah. That's such a good point. And like, you know, you pick your destination and then like you're on a journey. So whether or not you get there, it's like, how do you make each step of the way as like true and beautiful as possible. I would say not perfect, not happy, fuck all of that, not positive, but like, how can you just be with yourself through it? So you're actually having the experience and not again, like bypassing it. Yeah, exactly. I also think there's an element of like learning every day because down here in Mexico, like I have, there's 50 things that I have to learn every day. That's like new. Um, also entrepreneurship. Yes. And it's sometimes it just gets so hard that I'm, I just like shut down and put on Netflix because Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't want to like deal with that. But I've also had to do a lot of deprogramming from living in the States my whole life Mm -hmm. of like, I can go to the dentist for $30 and that's it. Like, wow. Just like being like, okay with that Mm -hmm. is like a learning experience. And like my husband went to the doctor the other day for 30 pesos, which is a dollar fifty? Oh my god! <laughs> wow. Yeah, and then got a prescription for two hundred pesos, which is like ten dollars. Wow. And and then just being able to experience life in a different way, mm-hmm. unprogramming is is you know that's its own journey. Right. Right. What an incredible gift to give your kids too. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We're doing private school down here which Mm -hmm. we're paying like, just for like, uh, reference, because Mm -hmm. I do realize that I came from one of the most expensive areas in the world, Mm -hmm. but we had looked into private school because SF does a lottery system, which is like, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, but it was going to cost us 30,000 ish a year Mm -hmm. in SF down here. It cost us $600. Oh my goodness. Like, what I think would have been better quality than we actually would have gotten in the States. Wow. That's incredible. So if you could go back to yourself a year ago, kind of like sitting in that office, like getting the passports, like what, if you could whisper something like into your ear, tell yourself a message, like what would you tell yourself? Oh man, that's also a hard question. You asked the hardest, simplest question. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> that is real talent. Um, I would say that it all works out. 
because mm-hmm. that's been my motto for the past year is every time that I think that I don't know how I'm going to do something or how I'm going to work it out. And I think back to being in that office, it all works out. I love that you just said that as you were telling the story about being in the airport and stuff, I'm of course reflecting on like my own experiences too. And I'm someone who doesn't always leave like the most amount of time when I'm traveling and that would stress other people out. But for me, it's fine. (laughs) And in my head, my mantra, like the thing I repeat over and over again, as I'm traveling is everything works out for Aaron. Everything works out for Aaron. I will, I will literally say it over and over and over in my head. I've taught my kids to do the same thing. Um, and it does. Like, it's not always the way I expected, but like sometimes a delay in a drink is like actually what you need and not to get on that plane. And like, there's all of these things that like, yeah, there's annoyances and there's things that go wrong and extra paperwork and getting a doctor to do something. And I love just being able to say too, like, how is this serving me without bypassing some of the fucked up shit that actually happens that is not okay. But in the moments where like there is some room for flexibility and for receiving to just be like, oh, what am I getting out of this? Oh, I have this time. I'm going to journal. I wouldn't have done this other another way. Like there's so many gifts like along the way. It really is. Mm -hmm. It really is. Like sometimes the detour is like what you actually need. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say that uh, (laughs) here's another simple, hard question (laughs) on a scale of one to 10, when you were making those decisions, how much did you trust yourself? And then now on a scale of one to 10, how much do you trust yourself? So my friend that um, had fronted me the remainder of my contract was actually the voice for me because Mm. I would say one. I didn't trust myself at all because I also combined with the pressure of what was happening with COVID and, and just like my husband not having income anymore. It was all just like way too confusing for me. And this is the other thing about community Mm -hmm. is that our community stepped up. Like my friend, Kristen, I think Mm -hmm. she should be named. Mm -hmm. Um, Kristen, is the one who was the sound voice in my head because at the time I could not make the right decisions. And she actually, during those 72 hours was like the one that I went to. And I was like, we lost the passports in Mexico City. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, go get a bottle of water, sit down, take 10 deep breaths. Like she walked oh, us. Those back. kind of friends are the best friends. Yes. Because because they're neutral and they're just there for you and putting you back in your power to make the decision versus being like, here's what to do. Make like, go find, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, love that. Shout out to all of the friends who trust you to make decisions versus. Yeah. Oh, so good. Um, the other thing too, because this is the question I always get asked is what happened to your stuff? So we, our family, the day of, um, they had come over to visit and, um, this is Juan's cousins and they were like, yes, you're really going to get on an airplane and leave. And they're like, okay. Um, they went to our apartment and packed everything up and put it in a U-Haul. Oh my gosh. They turned our car back into the dealership. They got it detailed for us. Um, we just sent them all the money and we're like, do whatever you got to do. But Um, Again, the power of community. Yes. Yeah. And then also like leaning into it because, um, my mom used to tell me like, um, because I'm half Hawaiian. So my, my Hawaiian culture was very much like, you don't ask for help. Like you, you need to do it on your own or like, you just don't ever ask for help. And I have learned to let go of that. Mm -hmm. And when you ask for help, it's, and then receiving, cause I think that's a receiving problem, mm-hmm. right? Like just to know that like your family does want to help you and like your community does want to help you. And if they know that you need help, um, they're willing to help you. I had clients sent to me because people knew that I had, um, left and left everything behind. And, somebody packed our stuff up for us. Somebody was in messenger every day, guiding me through it. And like being the sound, normal rested voice in my head that I needed. And that's what got me through. That to me sounds like when you trust and when you're brave, like the support is there, especially when you're someone who's been showing up in integrity over time. Like you've been serving, you've been upholding your word. You've been like, 
providing that it's almost like a savings account. Then when it's like, okay, I actually need support. Like people love helping people love showing up and supporting you. And like, it's just so that back and forth and that flow is really beautiful. And I think that's really what you're at the end of the day, like that's what we're doing in the communities too. Where like, if money might be the thing coming in from your clients, but it's because you're providing them value and transformation and a safe slash brave space where like you're doing something and like, yeah, it's really, really incredible. And maybe if we zoom out even further, like that's kind of just what we're freaking doing as humans. And like, like we're here to help each other. So how can you show up and serve and how can you receive from the other side too? Yeah. I mean, I kind of think about that with you too, Erin, because I, I know that like you have cared for me in moments where we weren't exchanging money mm-hmm. and you cared for me deeply. And it came from a place of like, just like realness. Yeah. And And then on the other side of it, like when you have a, when you have a product or something, I'm like, yep. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I will give you money because I know when I'm not giving you money, you care about me. Oh, so and that is I what do. happens in the Facebook groups that we're talking about yes. is like, yeah. I show up and thank you for sharing that too. But like, I genuinely love you. I love my clients. Like, and perhaps yeah. that's inappropriate, but like not from, from a purely like universal way of like, we are humans. We are on the same path. Like I have something that might help you. Let me help you. And it doesn't always yeah. matter. I think there's a lot of money mindset bullshit. That's like, don't help people if they can't pay. like, fuck that. Right. At the end of the day, this is human to human connection. And like you get to check in with your integrity around what feels right. And if what feels right is showing up and serving, even though there's not money attached to it, like do that. Fuck everyone who tells you not to just do it in a way where you have boundaries and you are supported. And like the more and more I think you can trust yourself, the more you can break all the rules. So 100%. Damn. Well, this was amazing. Joanna, tell us For anyone who wants to learn more about building their group, really looking at this, not, I I feel like we talk about this every time we've talked recently because I fucking love it, which is like, people are always looking for community managers. What you actually need is the perspective of a manager of community. And so if people are ready to think about their community, community differently, but also take steps, have the templates, like figure out what you need. Joanna probably has it, whether it's like intensive or a tool for you. Um, where should they go? What should they do? How can they find you? So I'm on Facebook. Experience and Magic is my business page. I have a Facebook group called Community Magic. And that's probably like the best place to hang out. And obviously it's a container that people are trying to learn about. So it's, it's a nice spot to be in. Um, experienceandmagic.com is my website. I'm also on Instagram at experience and magic. And um, yeah, so my whole thing is like, if you have a team, we could probably leverage your team is mm-hmm. what I've learned over time is that adding a community manager onto the team is a lot of overhead for people just for one specific aspect of their marketing plan. So my goal is to empower your team to do it for you. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much genuinely for sharing your story, for sharing like your wisdom with us and just thank you for you. Thank you for you, Erin. I appreciate you so much. (laughs) Thanks. You're so welcome. (laughs) And thank you for you, beautiful listener. (laughs) Sincerely, thank you so much for tuning in and listening for this episode. I digitally live over at erinlindstrom.com and I spend a lot of time on Instagram where I am at Erin Lindstrom. So feel free to come on over to my page. Send me a DM. I would love to hear what struck you from this conversation. I hope it was helpful. Let me know your takeaways. I always appreciate your shares so we can help get the word out about the show. There is a link in my Instagram bio where there's access to a ton of cool, some of it free stuff, including my sales and money mindset course, which was $497 and I am currently offering for free. So feel free to go get that. We can do some of the inner work together. Hope you have a beautiful rest of your day and I will talk to you soon.